Hello everybody, um, it goes without saying that I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy and looking after one another and, and washing, I was going to say washing your hands, but washing anything, everything, just just wash everything. I hope that you're all doing okay, um, obviously everything is in a complete tiz at the moment and that's putting it mildly. One of the uh, consequences of a global pandemic is that Shipping around the world is much, much slower, of course it is, and way, way, way down on anyone's list of priorities is the fact that um, my book is taking a lot of time to get to places like America and Australia and um, all over the place. But it is on the way, I promise you, it is. It's just held up by the madness. It, but it is on its way. I'm, I appreciate that it's frustrating and irritating when you've ordered something on Amazon or, or you know, wherever, and it hasn't turned up yet, so I can only apologise and it is definitely on the way but I thought by way of just acknowledgement of how rubbish it is to have paid your money and to have not have got the book just yet I thought that I would read you the introductory chapter so you can wet your whistle I suppose and here it is Curious History of Sex and if I get the perspective right on the camera I can make myself look like a hobbit like a tiny person reading a ridiculously huge book this is an insanely huge book I must have had a lot to say right the introduction here we go. Are you sitting comfortably? Sex is one of the great universal levelers. We eat, we sleep, we shit, we fuck and we die. Desire cuts across boundaries of culture, gender and class. It cares little for our rules and as anyone who's ever been caught with their pants down will tell you, it cares even less for common sense. Of course, humans do far more than just eating, shitting and fucking. It's our intellect that really sets us apart from the beasts. And therein lies the problem. To say that humans have overthought sex is something of an understatement. All life on this planet shares the desire to reproduce. But what makes humans really unique are the infinitely complex and varied ways that we seek to gratify sexual desire. In forensic and medical legal aspects of sexual crimes and unusual sexual practices, Professor Anil Agrawal lists 547 different paraphilic sexual interests and notes that, quote, like allergies, Sexual interest and arousal may occur from anything under the sun, including the sun. And in case you're wondering, sexual arousal caused by the sun is called actorasty. Humans are the only creatures that stigmatise, punish and create shame around their sexual desires. While all animals have courtship rituals, no wildebeest has ever gone into therapy because it's struggling to express a latex fetish. The queen honeybee will shag up to 40, 40 partners in one session return to her hive, dripping in semen and clutching the severed cocks of her conquests, and not one drone will call her a slut. Male baboons will happily bugger each other all day long and never fear being sent to a gay conversion camp. Yet the guilt humans feel around our desires can be utterly paralysing, and severe punishments have been doled out to those who break the rules. Colombian novelist Gabriel Garcia Marquez once wrote that everyone has three lives, a public life, a private life and a secret life. Paradoxically, our secret life is us at our most honest. We force this honest piece of ourselves into secrecy because the systems we've created have rendered it incompatible with our public and private lives. In an effort to control this secret part of ourselves, humans turn sex into a moral issue and develop complex social structures to regulate our urges. We invent categories to try and control it. Gay, straight, monogamous, virginal, promiscuous, etc. But sexuality doesn't fit neatly into man-made boxes, it spills over, and that's when things get messy. When we try to suppress our desire, it becomes like a fault line, running underneath the structures of morality, ethics and decency. But when the pink mist descends, people will still risk the earthquake for the orgasm. The act of sex itself hasn't changed since we first worked out what went in where. Penises, tongues and fingers have been probing mouths, vulvas and anuses in search of an orgasm since humans first crawled out the primordial sludge. But what does change is the social script that dictates how sex is culturally understood and performed. For example, according to Pornhub, the largest pornography site on the internet, lesbian has remained the number one search term used on their site worldwide since they first launched in 2007. In the Netherlands, Lesbian searches on Pornhub were up by 45% in 2018 from 2016. So it's fair to say that the Dutch give lesbian sex a big thumbs up. However, they've not always been so appreciative of the V on V love. Between 1400 and 1550, 15 women were burned alive in the Netherlands as, quote, female sodomites. 
those who were not put to death were still faced with severe punishments. In 1514, Martin van Kieschart and Gian van den Steen of Bruges were both publicly flogged, had their hair burnt off, and were banished from the city for having, having committed, quote, a certain great kind of unnatural sodomy with several young girls. 600 years later, the unnatural sin of sodomy with several young girls is the most watched porn category amongst the same descendants of the very people who thought it perfectly reasonable to chuck lesbians on a bonfire. Pornhub searches for porn for women were up by 359% in 2018, with women viewing lesbian pornography a whopping 197% more than men did in the same year. This would have come as quite a shock to Dr William Acton, who claimed in the 19th century that the majority of women, happily for them, are not much troubled with sexual feeling of any kind. And what the Sunday Express editor, James Douglas, would have made of all this is anyone's guess. In 1928, Douglas attacked Radcliffe's whole landmark lesbian novel, The Well of Loneliness, writing that, quote, This pestilence is devastating the younger generation. It is wrecking young lives. It is defiling young souls. Douglas urged society to, quote, cleanse itself from the leprosy of these lepers. And yet here we are, 90 years later, with millions of women around the world jilling off to such pestilence with our leprous souls intact. What a time to be alive. This is a book about how sexual attitudes have changed throughout history. It's a curious history of sex and some of the things we've done to ourselves and to each other in pursuit and denial of the almighty orgasm. It's not a comprehensive study of every sexual quirk, kink and ritual across all cultures throughout time, as this would entail writing an encyclopedia. Rather, this is a drop in the ocean, a paddle in the shallow end of sex history, but I hope that you'll get pleasantly wet nonetheless. I've tried to use subjects that provide valuable context for issues today, particularly issues of gender, sexual shame, beauty, language, and how desire has been regulated. I have chosen subjects that are close to my heart, such as the history of sex work, deeply emotive subjects like abortion, but also subjects that have made me laugh, like cocklebread and orgasming on a bike. Although it's easy to laugh at the silly things people believe throughout history, and I hope that you do, it's far more valuable to see how similar we are to people who've gone before us and question our own beliefs as a result. Sex remains a deeply divisive issue around the world, and in many places it remains a matter of life and death. These attitudes will turn and turn again, hopefully for the better. But we will never arrive at a place where sex is free of stigma and shame unless we first know where we have come from. <laughs>